recording and here we go. So welcome everybody. This is actually the final presentation of the Wells College 2021 activism series. Um, we were all virtual this year, which was really exciting. Um, and so we're happy to have you here today. Um, Tara Loy Ash has been a certified therapeutic recreation specialist since 2000 and is currently an assistant professor and currently assistant professor and therapeutic recreation program director at Regis College in Weston, Mass. Before entering higher education, um, she held leadership positions in long-term care facilities in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Wells College, a Master of Education in Therapeutic Recreation from Springfield College, and is pursuing a Doctorate of Philosophy in Recreational Therapy from Clemson University. Tara belongs to the American Therapeutic Recreation Association and the Gerontology Oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to say that. Gerontological. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to trip over it for 10 minutes. Society of America. Her research interests include ageism, sexism, and long-term care, advancement of person-centered care, and cultural competency in health delivery. Um, so the Wells College um, land acknowledgement is Wells College recognizes our collective responsibility to acknowledge our colonial history. The land is the traditional land of the Cuga Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Wells College commits itself to ensuring that traditions and culture of indigenous peoples are embraced and reflected upon in order to engage in solidarity with the Cuga Nation. And on that note, I will hand things over. Thank you, Emily. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to be able to speak um, for the Wells College community. Even though we are small, um, we, a small group today, at least uh, we're a little bit mighty. So I'm hoping that we can have more of a conversation today. Um, and I will certainly share, um, you know, everything that I have to share. But if you have any questions while I'm speaking, please feel free to just interrupt me. Um, go ahead and ask um, if you want to put anything in the chat. Um, actually, and I'll ask Emily and Rachel if you guys could watch the chat for me and just let me know if there's any questions that come up. Um, but I'm hoping that this can be something uh, that, you know, is very conversational. Okay, so what are we talking about today? All right, and everyone can still see my screen, right? As I'm switching slides, I just wanna make sure. Okay, all right, so we are gonna talk about ageism. That's the biggest topic for today. So what exactly is it? Uh, what is implicit bias? How the two uh, kind of connect to each other and how ageism has impacted our views on nursing home residents, um, especially during COVID-19. Uh, so looking at COVID-19, what's been going on in our country and other countries and how that's really affected um, our older adult population. Um, I have done a lot of research that specifically focuses on compassionate ageism. So we'll also discuss that. And I have a study to share. So um, I am a, a PhD candidate with Clemson University, like Emily said, and I, I'm actually finishing up writing my dissertation. I'm hoping to defend in June. So the information I'm sharing with you today, uh, you're all the first to hear about it. So <laughs> my dissertation committee hasn't even heard about it yet. So I'm really excited to share that, certainly. Um, so, and also um, I have a term conformity of care that I've kind of come up with from uh, the research that uh, has you know, been conducted. And then where do we go from here? So here's all this information, but then how are we gonna apply it, right? Um, Cause it's great to have this information, but what does it mean in the future? What does it mean um, for our society and the people that we're caring for? All right, so a little bit about me. Um, I was expecting we'd have a little bit more students so I could share my journey a, a bit, but that's okay. I'll just quickly go over this. So um, I did go to Wells College. Uh, I have a BA in psychology from Wells, uh, 98. So definitely go evens. I wore my blue today for, for our evens. Um, I have a master's degree from Springfield. I'm a certified therapy recreation specialist. So it took me a while to get back to school. So I worked for about 18 years specifically in nursing home care. 
uh, that's where my the area of my expertise and I decided that I wanted to try higher education uh, so I was able to uh, you know have a chance teaching decide that I liked it and I would go back to school uh, so I uh, this is my fourth year at Clemson so again hopefully uh, successfully defending a dissertation come June. So my dissertation is actually about intersections of identity, um, intersections of ageism, ableism, and also gender. And so exploring individuals that work with nursing home residents, how they feel about age, specifically um, how they feel about their aging residents. And I think it's really interesting. So we have, you know, some studies out there that look at nursing students or physical physical therapy or occupational therapy students and how they feel about older adults. But um, to date, there isn't a study that looks at direct care workers and um, how they feel about the people that they're taking care of, which um, you would think would be a good thing to know. So I'm hoping that this research kind of ignites a line of research in the future. Um, and I am working at Regis College right now. Okay, so I want to start with a question for everybody. At what age are you old? When do you get old? If you just want to throw it up in the chat, if you don't want to say anything, that's okay. Um, if you want 10 to years at, 10 years after whatever age you are now. <laughs> yeah. So always, since you're always ahead, 10 years ahead? Yeah. <laughs> at least. I agree. At least. <laughs> if we had to put a number, what do we think? I'm always interested. And there's no right or wrong, yeah. right? I tell my students this, there's no right or wrong. What's, what's old? I always say 80. 80, okay. So we got 80. I have some students who say 40. I'm old now, Tara, 45. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so in that 40 age. <laughs> Any other thoughts? talking about your eyes or the rest of your body? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, some of our bodies kind of feel a little bit differently than others. <laughs> Certainly, I had to, yeah, I had to buy my first um, pair of readers, uh, which was interesting. Well, at our 25th reunion, where everybody's about in their like early ish to mid 40s, everybody whipped out the reading glasses. Yeah. It was like the joke, you know, we all got up mm -hmm. on the stage with that. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they certainly come in, in handy. So, age, there really isn't an age. I would say a general age when you're you're old. So age is really an individual's perception, um, how they're feeling, how they feel about others. Um, so generally, younger people will say that old age starts at a younger age, and then older people will say that old age starts at an older age. Um, so the World Health Organization they say that old age starts at 65, and that's mostly because. The, the benefits that individuals receive is usually at 65, right? We look at retirement, we look at other senior benefits, it's 65. Um, so depending on what country you're living in, age, old age, um, you know, your culture, your experiences, old age can differ. Um, and also there's, it's a broad range, right? So when some individuals think 50, right? Maybe 50 is old, and then some are saying 80, but then we have individuals that are living until 90 or even 100. So when we're looking at that range, um, so say 50 to 100, that's 50 years. That's a big chunk of time. And a lot of, thing, a lot of things happen within that time, different experiences, different um, you know, abilities, different um, you know, cultures, different traditions. And especially when we look at pediatrics, uh, pediatrics, that specialty, that's really looking at what age zero to 18, that's 18 years. Um, so our geriatricians, um, really they could be seeing individuals from 50 to 100. Uh, so what I've been doing is I actually refer to different age groups. I have names for different age groups within that age spectrum. So, you know, 50 to 70, uh, might be an older adult, uh, 70 and older would be long living. Just because I wanna respect that there's different experiences that people are having. And we can't say that a 50 year old is having the same experience as a 90 or 100 year old. Um, that's a big difference, especially when those long living adults, um, more than likely they are in nursing homes or um, they're in, you know, receiving some type of long-term care support. Um, so really it depends on, uh, where you live, what your experiences are, uh, what's the norm for your country, what's the norm for your family, um, and those perceptions can change too. Um, so it's kind of like almost a little sticky to define um, age, like how old, <laughs> at what age are you old? 
certainly. Um, so a little bit about our aging population. Um, so we've all heard about our baby boomers, they're getting older. By 2030, our baby boomers, they're going to be older than 65. Um, so that means that one in every five residents, they're going to be at retirement age. So we have this large population um, that is moving into that retirement age, into that old age, and then eventually that long living age. Um, uh, sector. Uh, one in three people turning 65, they're going to require nursing home care at some point during their lives. Um, and so if there are any students that have popped in, I will say that this is job security. Um, a lot of students don't see themselves working with older adults. Um, I typically have students that want to work with children. Um, a lot of us, you know, just uh, see ourselves working um, with adults or with children, not necessarily older adults, but there is a need, there's a significant need for people caring for this older adult population. Um, the biggest segment that's growing is those long living adults. So those adults that are 85 or older, um, you know, people are aging, but they're also, um, you know, aging longer. So really looking at those needs and that specific population is really important. Um, and something that's actually very interesting, again, um, our pediatricians are, you know, taking care of individuals zero to 18 generally. So we have about 61,000, 62,000 pediatricians in the United States. Um, and we only have 7,000 geriatricians currently, um, which is staggering. That's a, that's a huge difference. So there's this preference to work with the younger population, but we really need individuals to work with that older population. Um, and I can say, I did a little bit of research and it appears that pediatricians make more money than geriatricians. Um, so really working with that younger population, it's more valued in our society. Um, even when we look at medical um, specialties, which is very interesting. So it's expected that we're going to need about 30,000 geriatricians by 2030 to care for all of the individuals that are aging. Uh, so there really is this increased need. So I'm hoping that students, once they learn about working with older adults, um, learning about ageism, uh, you know, can really embrace the possibility of working with older adults because there, again, there is a need. There certainly is a need. Um, if anything, I really want people to walk away today and have the question of why. Um, you know, so why do I prefer working with children? Um, you know, why would maybe I? would I not want to live in a nursing home? Um, so really opening up that question of why after we talk about some different things. All right, so ageism and implicit bias. So I, I really want to just give some definitions here uh, just to kind of make sure that everyone's on the same page because we hear ageism a lot. That term's been around since 1969. Uh, and we hear about individuals that are discriminated against based on their age, maybe, uh, you know, in... Um, you know, in the professional life, uh, you know, maybe, you know, outside of, of that personal life, but in a different area. Um, so ageism, technically, it's stereotypes and discrimination against people based on older age. And there's different types of ageism. Uh, there's personal ageism, right? So those could be personal beliefs that you have uh, about older adults. And then there's institutional um, ageism. So those are maybe rules, uh, procedures, systems that are put in place um, by different organizations that uh, discriminate against individuals that are older. Um, there's also hostile ageism. So we might have heard, especially uh, during the pandemic, hearing about older adults and, um, you know, I heard uh, some, thankfully not my close friends, but, you know, some individuals, um, you know, older adults, like, oh, you know, it's okay if they, if they pass, they've lived their lives, um, you know, we, should, we shouldn't worry about them, we really need to focus on, you know, younger adults, we need to focus on children. Um, so that could be um, considered hostile ageism. Um, and then there's uh, benevolent or compassionate ageism, which we're gonna talk about today. And that's where we are focused on protecting everyone who's older. So anyone, maybe they're 65 and older, they need protection, they're vulnerable, right? So older adults is considered a vulnerable population. Um, they, you know, they definitely need our help. Uh, and maybe they don't want our help. <laughs> maybe they, they're doing okay the way they are. Um, so we're gonna talk about that because a lot of people who work with older adults they care about their safety. Um, they care about their well-being, um, but maybe they care too much or the way that they're caring. Um, and we'll get back to that. 
Um, so there's bias and then there's implicit bias. So our bias is when we have preference for um, you know, one group over another group. And implicit bias is when we have those attitu attitudes towards certain people, but we aren't conscious of them. Uh, and everyone has implicit bias, depending on how we grew up, uh, depending on our culture, uh, what we were taught from our parents, the experiences that we've had, we can't help but have implicit bias. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with having implicit bias. Um, really, the issue is when individuals aren't able to reflect or recognize the bias that they have. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that too. So when we think about different groups, when we think about individuals that we spend time with, um, you know, when we think about, I prefer, I'm pursuing a career working with children. Um, you know, is there some implicit bias involved? Um, why you prefer working with children versus working with older adults? Um, so really implicit bias and being aware of it gives us an opportunity to reflect on the experiences that we've had and then maybe change our behaviors and change the way that we think. And when we are open to discussing uh, different ideas and learning about different cultures and learning about different experiences, uh, you know, that's when we become uh, more inclusive, certainly. So implicit ageism, um, that's specifically when you are, um, you know, have certain stereotypes and different and certain attitudes towards individuals that are older, but you don't really recognize them. Um, you know, it's and it might be something again. Um, you know, we were we were joking about having glasses, or maybe oh, I'm getting older, so I'm I'm very forgetful. Um, you know, so there's just these little these little pieces um, that we've been taught. When we get older, we should expect to you know lose our memory. Um, we should expect to need more assistance. Uh, you know, and. And usually, sometimes that isn't the case. That isn't the case for every single person that gets older. Um, so th that's just one quick little example. All right. So um, I just want to put in some every some examples of everyday ageism that we probably have um, heard or maybe even have said ourselves, but um, it's kind of ingrained in our culture, and we we hear it a lot, and we hear. It from other people too, so I don't really think anything about it. Um, so again, so attributing, you know, being forgetfulness to your age. So if you're a college student, um, you know, in, if you're in your 20s and you forget something, more than likely you're not going to say, oh, it's my age, that's why I'm forgetting. And I can tell you as a college student, I mean, when I was at Wells, I was so stressed out, I was forgetting stuff all the time. Like I forget assignments and, and all of that. I never said, oh, it's my age, it's because I'm 20. Um, you know, it's because I was really stressed. Uh, so when you're older and you're, you're forgetful, or you, maybe you've forgotten something, um, you know, we're very quick to jump onto Oh, it must be because I'm older. Um, when really, could it be something else? Could you be stressed? Uh, could there be a lot going on? Um, you know, th there's different reasons. Uh, also, the marketing that we're looking at today. So there's a lot of marketing towards youth. We are very youth obsessed as a culture. Um, when we look um, on the TV, you see a lot of young individuals. Um, if they are older, um, generally they are looking younger, right? They have everything put together. You're not going to see any wrinkles really. Um, so 90% of our marketing dollars, we're actually targeting people younger than 50. Um, so in general, as a whole. So we're, we're really marketing that younger age group, but people 50 and older generally have more disposable income than younger individuals. Um, so it is kind of interesting that we're focused on an, an age group that may, that may be, you know, that doesn't necessarily have the funds versus that older age group. Um, so my aunt, my great aunt, she is, she's 92 or she's 93 and she lives alone. And uh, my mom has been trying to get her to go to the senior center so she can make some new friends. And she doesn't want to go there. And can you guess why she doesn't want to go to the senior center? Why don't we want to go? Because it's full <laughs> of old people. It's old. Yes, right it's now. old people, right? There's I don't want to go people, there. Right? There's old people there. I don't want to go to the nursing home. There's old people. Even when I worked in the nursing home and um, there were people that came in for rehab, so they planned to go back home. Um, they wouldn't come out of their rooms. There's old people out there, um, even though they're the same age. Um, so even individuals that are older can show signs of ageism um, by you know the way that they are responsive to not only older adults, but 
institutions that support older adults. So again, the senior centers, assisted living, nursing home, there's a lot of stigma associated to these organizations that support older adults, right? And why, right? There's, it, when age, considering that aging is a natural progression, we're all going to age, right? No matter um, where you were born, where you come from, what your culture is, what your race is, uh, your sexuality, all of that. The only, the one thing that we have in common is that we are all going to age. We share that. We share that. So why are we so afraid of it? Why, you know, why do we want to stay away from that? Again, all of these whys, and these are whys to take back. Because um, again, I have an hour, that's it. Uh, we could talk for a whole semester about this, um, but I just want to you know, get everyone thinking about this. Um, another one that I would, when I worked in the nursing home, and some of you may have said this, if you ever went to a nursing home, or if you, if there's individuals that like working with older adults, oh, she's so cute, he's so cute. Oh, they're so forgetful, it's so adorable. They're in their wheelchair. Um, really, that's <laughs> that that's a form of ageism. Why, why are we speaking down to older adults in that way? Why are we treating them like children? Um, and I've even had, so I, I did some interviews for my study and I had even had some nurses um, that said, uh, you know, I like working with older adults because it reminds me of children. Um, you know, there's, it's kind of this circle of life and, and you, they're just innocent and they need protection. They need me to be there to keep them safe. Um, so they make that connection between um, aging in a nursing home and being a child, which is interesting because <laughs> these individuals, even if someone is diagnosed with dementia, if someone um, you know, isn't able to speak the way they used to, they have all these experiences. Those experiences haven't gone away. That knowledge hasn't left them. Um, you know, they can still understand what you're saying. So um, speaking down to someone um, like that is, is ageism essentially. Um, and it actually even has a term elder speak. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that before. Um, kind of when you refer to someone, when you, when you say someone's cute, um, when your voice might go up. And I actually, when I reflect on my experiences in the nursing home, I did the exact same thing. Um, I would say, oh, I love working with older adults because, you know, they're adorable. I love their stories. Um, and I would, when I would speak to them, it was almost um, like the the tone in my voice, the pitch went up. Uh, so really being aware of that is important when you're interacting with older adults, because we do, we tend to um, infantile them in ways. Um, and the big one, oh, actually before this big one, all older adults are lonely. <laughs> so we've seen this in the pandemic. We said, oh my gosh, the, the pandemic, you know, we um, have individuals, uh, you know, that need to quarantine and we have a second pandemic of loneliness. Uh, we, we hear this a lot, especially with our older adults. And you see pictures on the news of, um, you know, older people in their homes and they're looking out their window um, and everything else. Everyone was lonely, <laughs> Every, you know, can we just say, oh, it's just older adults. No, everyone was quarantining. Um, you know, a lot of I mean, people, I'm it didn't really depend on age. Oh, go ahead. I'm gonna challenge you on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, I think that it's true that the pandemic isolation hit certain populations of older adults harder uh, for a couple of practical reasons, if not some of the psychological reasons. For instance, there are many older adults uh, who had to give up driving mm -hmm. and who were previously, even though they gave, had to give up driving, you know, a friend could come over or a relative could come over and take them yeah. somewhere. They didn't were not able to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that for uh, a number of practical, you know, I could go down the list, but I, you can probably all figure out, you know, what some of the other reasons are. There, there are some very practical reasons for which some older adults suffered a greater degree of loneliness because they were even more cut off mm -hmm. because of some of these practical reasons. So I, I think it's, I, I, I don't totally disagree with you, but I think uh, the thinking about this has to be more nuanced. Mm -hmm. I, no, and I agree. I think that um, individuals that were dependent on those services um, certainly did, um, you know, suffer when they weren't able to receive those services. I think, and I and I think that certainly older adults were in that age group. Also, people with disabilities. Yes. Um, so it wasn't just that aging population. But I do agree. There were when we weren't able to provide those services. Um, you know, uh, people certainly people felt that. Um, so I don't, but I mean, just because someone was older doesn't mean that they were lonely or they weren't. Um, I, I guess I feel like there was this blanket statement of if, you know, individuals are older, 
then, you know, they were lonely, they weren't able to get out. Um, and then it was placed mostly on that older age group without looking at other areas too. Um, so that my point, does that make sense? Yeah, I, well, I think maybe it was more the conflation of mm -hmm. the, this idea that old people are lonely and mm -hmm. then the uh, conflation of that with the pandemic, because I think the pandemic mm -hmm. created circumstances during which that um, trope was probably more true than it usually is. Mm -hmm. is yes. Oh, it was completely yeah. exacerbated by COVID-19, definitely. Yeah. 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 No, I completely agree. Um, I, hey, and, Tara. Yeah. Sorry. There was also like a study like recently that I saw on, I think it was on Newsweek. They talked about the effect of the pandemic on all single people, mm -hmm. like how this really affected people who were middle-aged and being like 30 and up being alone mm -hmm. and how much this affected them. Yeah, but so I think, oh, go ahead. It is, it is true that there's, there's this, again, this trope that being old necessarily translates into being lonely, mm -hmm. which is that what I think you're talking about. Hey, Marit. <laughs> Hi, Ria. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we also have an emphasis on this baby boomer generation and this fear that for some reason they're going to um, kind of eat up all these resources. Um, so instead of just looking at this age group, um, you know, what are some other um, social determinants of health, right? So it's not just the aging population, but it's also, um, you know, the access to uh, food, the walkability of a neighborhood, um, also crime. So individuals are, you know, uh, receiving what they need, but we seem to be focused on just that. We have this big aging population, um, at least and that's what I've seen. Okay, all right, so focus today, compassion and ageism. So again, individuals that I spoke to, they were very, um, they, they loved their jobs. They enjoyed working with older adults, um, but they definitely felt that there needed to be certain policies put in place to help them. Um, so we look at that structural uh, you know, piece of it and that older adults were victims too. Um, and we think about there were, there were plenty of, um, you know, we had an increase in deaths in the nursing homes that we saw with COVID-19, um, which I actually have one of my slides here, right? So we saw a lot of this, uh, which was kind of scary. Um, and in a way, individuals living in these nursing homes, they were sitting ducks. Um, so we had individuals that, uh, you know, were with roommates, um, you know, they weren't able to leave the building. Um, there were staff coming in and out. Uh, so there really wasn't that control. Um, so there was this focus on, you know, we really need to protect these individuals. And I think a lot of people that have been working in those nursing homes um, and, you know, uh, you know, caring for these individuals, there is this, this sense of protection and vulnerability, um, which also spilled over into, you know, individuals that, um, you know, live outside the nursing home community too. Um, so there's just this generalized uh, view that because you're older, um, you know, we need to protect you. We need to make sure that you're safe. Um, and people are actually seen as victims of this aging process and of growing older, um, which, you know, if someone's seen as a victim when they're, as they're aging, as they're getting older, um, it doesn't really make anyone else really excited about growing older or, um, or aging. Um, and so, um, again, we could go into, you know, terror management theory. Oh, go ahead. Just one. Actually, I just like, as you've been like, kind of saying that I, and especially like the stat at the beginning about like pediatric, um, mm -hmm. pediatricians, like more so than people who, do you think it's just because there's so much more just general research about babies and children and a focus there and maybe it's more of just like a lack of understanding or like this unbiased fear because we don't know what you know we then the oh, question we would be why. oh would you say Raya? then the question if if what emily is saying is true then the question mm -hmm. that doesn't answer the question it raises the uh, next question of if, if that's true then the question that's raised is why mm-hmm 
right? So why do we have more if we do? And I don't know. I know there's plenty of research on older adults and aging, um, but I don't, I don't know compared to, you know, uh, pediatrics or younger children, but it, that is, that, that raises why. So why are more people doing more research on, you know, younger adults and children versus older adults? So, um, you know, where is, why as a society, as researchers, are we valuing this age group over another age group? But that's, it, it's true. It makes you think. It's, a, it's, it's, it's why. And we look at our nursing students. Um, not many nursing programs require classes in gerontology um, or gerontological um, uh, process, so, or the aging process. So we have individuals that more than likely are nursing uh, students. They're, you know, going off working in hospitals where there's all different age groups. They, um, some of them are working in nursing homes. There's an increased need for nurses and uh, L, um, LPNs and RNs in nursing homes, but they don't have a class that's specifically dedicated to geriatrics. Um, so, so that's interesting too. So it's even our educational system, at least that I see on this end. So it raises, it raises a lot of questions, definitely. Okay, all right, so I just wanna throw these up there because I thought these were really interesting. Um, when I searched for um, older adults, COVID-19 pandemic. So we have this nice, <laughs> this nice little graphic on the left. So the dues for, um, you know, for the elderly during COVID-19 and we can talk about language too and um, you know, what elderly really, you know, kind of brings to mind when we talk about that. Um, so staying home and avoid avoiding visitors, washing your hands and your face, and then um, you know covering um, your mouth with your elbow when you sneeze or your cough. And I'm not really sure these are <laughs> these are dues specifically for that age group. I mean, th these are all suggestions that we were all given. Um, it wasn't just to older adults. Um, so I think it's interesting that um, there was this focus um, during COVID-19, this huge focus on age. Um, we look at numbers. So this other, uh, this other graph that's on the right, this is from uh, China, I believe, and this was in 2020. Um, and so they, there was a study that was conducted that said that most risk uh, from the coronavirus, we have age, um, except we're not looking at the other specifics. We're not looking at the other diagnoses that these individuals might have. As you age, you're more than likely to develop um, different health issues. That's certainly true. Um, you know, that happens, but it's not just your age, um, your age itself, that is the risk factor um, that we, you know, that we keep hearing about. Um, so age is not a chronic disease. Um, and that's the way it's being portrayed. That's the way that, um, you know, we're seeing it often, um, you know, in the news and, um, you know, the media, certainly. So um, individuals, you know, they're not dying from age, um, you know, they're dying from heart disease, uh, chronic heart failure, um, you know, cystic fibrosis, diabetes, those are um, the risks with COVID-19. Um, those are the comorbidities. Um, so really this focus on age, um, you know, was really kind of harmful to, you know, the numbers that we've been seeing with COVID. Um, so just an example, I threw up some other um, countries' uh, information. Italy reported that a quarter of its cases so far were among people ages 19 to 50. So again, it's not just this older adult population. Um, you know, we have younger adults, uh, you know, that are susceptible, that are dying from COVID also. Um, in Spain, a third are under the age of 44 that have um, passed from COVID. And then even in the United States, um, cases found that 29% uh, were ages 20 to 44. So yes, there is, again, as we age, we might see some more health conditions, certainly, but just to say, because you're older, um, you know, you are going to be at risk for COVID-19. It kind of leaves a lot out, right? It leaves a lot of those details out. All right, and we showed, we looked at, at this, um, and I feel like this is something that really, um, gave people pause when we saw information about this. Um, so one in four COVID deaths in the United States um, are happening in nursing homes. Um, again, they are in this uh, living environment that we've created for them. Um, and, and again, we're, you know, we aren't, um, you know, protect, protecting them. I think that, you know, there were nursing homes that weren't able, uh, you know, actually the nursing home individuals that I interviewed, for my dissertation at that nursing home, they were reusing PPE. They weren't able to get the amount of PPE that they needed to keep themselves safe and their residents safe. So there is, um, 
you know, an issue with how we're, you know, caring for our older adults, how we're caring for our elderly, um, you know, what we're able to provide for them. So something that just came up in the oh. chat was, um, mm -hmm. Laura says, agree, age is not the risk factor. It is comorbidities and how we house our older people in Norway, their nursing homes only have single rooms as a matter of mm -hmm. day. Yes. So we have, I've worked in nursing homes where there's been four or six people to a room. Um, so I, I mean, think there's no privacy. Um, there's very little autonomy, you know, how we're supposed to care for individuals in that way. And again, when we look at nursing homes and the way that they are set up, they're really based on a medical model of care. So individuals, um, when we were taking care of people and, uh, you know, we, we developed this hospital system. And what's great with a hospital is that you're sick, you need some, you know, you need some care. So you go in and then you leave. And then with a nursing home, <laughs> where, you know, if someone's entering a nursing home, that's their new home. They're not planning on leaving. Um, so we've created this home-like environment based on a medical model of care where individuals are supposed to enter the system and then leave. Um, our nursing homes, they're entering the system and there's never really an intention for them to leave. We're offering them the support, um, you know, so that they can, you know, if possibly, you know, spend the rest of their lives there. Um, so that medical model of care is really doing a disservice to individuals that need that level of care in a nursing home. Um, and I do think in the United States, it's, uh, there's other countries that, you know, do it <laughs> a lot better. In the United States, we're, we're just not meeting those needs. Um, so really, it isn't surprising that we have a lot of deaths in nursing homes from COVID-19. Just the way that we structured the care that we're providing. It's not that they're older, it's that how are we structuring this care? How are we, uh, you know, are we providing the equipment that's needed for individuals that are living there and that are working there too? Um, and then I, I thought it was interesting. So Massachusetts, I'm in Massachusetts specifically, um, and these, both of these articles, these snapshots um, were from within like three months of each other. Um, so we have a, a large amount of outbreaks in on college campuses, certainly, um, but we're not getting as much hype with this versus this picture here. We're like, oh, there's a lot going on. We're still having issues. Um, in Massachusetts, we uh, had one college that actually had to close because of the increased number of COVID cases. Um, so again, you know how, um, and, and people are in close proximity to each other. It's, it's living conditions. Um, we look at uh, numbers in cities versus numbers in countries, individuals that are you know, living in apartment buildings um, and policies that are put into place. Um, so we can't just look at age. We need to look at other areas also. Okay, all right, so these are my research questions for my study. Um, so I wanna see to what extent do ageist attitudes exist in a sample of employees and long-term care um, and specifically in one facility and then how these perceptions of aging have been influenced by um, working in that facility during COVID-19, during the pandemic. Um, and that was actually never intended to be my research question. It just kind of happened because I ended up collecting data during the pandemic. I was lucky enough to do that. So there's a little, a little switcheroo. Um, so I had a, a mixed method single case study design. So I just focused on one facility. Um, so I interviewed direct care employees in a facility in Boston, Massachusetts. So there were nursing employees, so CNAs, uh, uh, nurses, RNs, LPNs, and, al and also allied health professionals. So recreation therapists, uh, we had social workers, uh, and we also had a registered dietitian. Uh, so it was a it was a pretty decent group. So 60 surveys, uh, they answered questions uh, from the Fraboni scale of ageism. So it's 29 questions and it's a Likert style scale. Um, so you rate different statements um, as whether you agree or you don't agree. And I asked also questions about demographics. And then I interviewed group uh, individuals that were interested in that interview. All right, so what do we find out from this, uh, talking to all of these individuals that are working in long-term care in this nursing home setting? Um, so our Fraboni scale of ageism, those scores, there wasn't a statistical significance with any of the areas except for age. So even though ageist attitudes decreased with the 
increase in years of education, which I found interesting. There wasn't a statistical difference in that. Um, it was very slight. And that could be just because of the number, because um, they only had 60 uh, surveys at that time. Uh, so there was a statistical difference in scores between younger adults, adults, and then older adults. I kind of grouped them together. So the middle-aged adults um, had significantly higher uh, FSA scores than the younger adults. Raya, do you have a question? Are you? Oh, you're muted. Does a higher score mean a higher degree of ageism or does a lower yes. score mean? Okay. Yep, so higher, the higher the score, sorry, I should have <laughs> clarified that. The higher the score, um, the higher the ageism. And they didn't give us, and actually there's a lot of different survey tools um, that, um, assess ageism and they don't really give you a set uh, score. So, oh, if you get a 20 to 25 year ageist, if you get, you know, uh, you know, between like a, a 10 and a 15, you're not ageist at all. It's really the more, the higher your score, the more ageist, um, the more ageist attitudes that you have uh, or mo more negative attitudes towards older adults you have. Um, so really it was just, it was a comparison. So statistically adults had, um, higher scores had a, which was significant um, than the older adults and then also the older adults, which is very interesting. Um, definitely something to delve into when I write my discussion. Um, but I did look at race and gender, um, definitely, you know, occupation, and then how long they've been working in long-term care. Um, and really what was, I think, the, the second most interesting part of the survey was that the higher the number of years um, of education, uh, the lower the scores, even though there wasn't a statistical significance with that. All right, so for interviews, um, I asked different questions, how they felt about the uh, residents that they cared for, how they felt about aging, how they felt about themselves getting older. Um, one question that was really interesting, I asked all of them whether they saw themselves living in a nursing home. Um, and how many people do you think said that they we're going to live in a nursing home that they saw themselves in a nursing home. Zero. Very <laughs> few. Yeah. Very few. I think I had two. I had two that said, yeah, I guess I'll be in a nursing home. Um, yeah, at a 21. So a lot of them, and it was interesting because we'd have this conversation flowing, asking questions. And I said, oh, so do you think you'll ever enter a nursing home? And then crickets because almost, oh, I, maybe, but no, I, I don't want to do that. It was very, very adamant. No, <laughs> I don't want to enter a nursing home. Um, so I quoted all of the responses and came up with um, these different codes. Um, so there was definitely this um, feeling of vulnerability for the individuals that they worked with, um, also fear for them and this need to protect. Um, they, they wanted to protect them. They felt that um, they were like family members um, and they were you know, looking over them. Um, they also really identified as direct care workers. Um, it was kind of part of their identity. Um, but while they were identifying as, as uh, direct care workers, specifically working with older adults, um, there was kind of this aging detachment. So, um, you know, I love working with my older adults and they're wonderful. And, you know, when they're confused and, um, you know, it, it makes me so happy and that I can do things for them. Um, but, you know, as I age, I'm going to make sure I exercise. I'm going to make sure that, um, you know, I take my vitamins and I'm going to stay home and I'm not going to be in a nursing home. I'm not, I'm not going to be doing any of that. Um, so really this idea that they could almost control that aging process. And yes, we can make healthy choices. Um, and that certainly influences the way we live our lives, but we're all going to age. You can't, <laughs> you can't get away from that. Um, you know, we can't control, um, you know, especially if we, uh, you know, have um, an impairment, um, you know, if we have a disability, we can't control that. Um, and a lot of people equated independence and quality of life with being able to live, uh, you know, at home, being able to stay at home. Um, and I think that what really says to that, we have individuals that are, you know, in need of nursing home care. But another area we should look at is if individuals are happier being at home, maybe we need to, you know, put our resources into, stay, you know, individuals, you know, being able to stay at home if that's really what that quality of life is. But this is perspective from employees. I wasn't interviewing residents, but I think that would be something interesting um, to be able to look into, um, certainly. Um, and then also this 
a kind of uh, functional decline. So a lot of people felt bad for residents that had this functional decline um, cognitively or physically. Um, there were a few that preferred to work with residents that were able to move around on their own that didn't need you know, a whole lot of assistance. Um, but again, there really was this uh, you know, focus on um, independence being this indicator of quality of life. And for someone, if you're aging with a disability, uh, someone who's, you know, um, needed assistance throughout their lives, uh, then that would mean that they'd have no quality of life just simply because they are dependent on someone for care. That doesn't mean, um, and again, it doesn't mean if you're dependent on someone for care that you are, um, you know, you have a lower quality of life. Certainly. Okay, so big results. Biggest ones, aging and fear. Um, so there's a fear of aging for um, the individual, right? So they don't want to get older, but also a fear for the people that they are caring for, all right? So this need to protect, again, we need to protect them. They're in this situation, again, that we've put them in as a society. They're in a situation where they need to be protected and I need to protect them. Um, and during COVID-19, they actually feared for resident safety, um, which makes sense. I think if I was working in a nursing home, I'd probably feel the same way. Um, you know, COVID-19, it was scary. Like we were scared for ourselves and our families, but then um, for individuals that you're working with, you're scared for them too. Um, residents were considered their family, um, you know, and again, they were dissociating from that aging process because they feared um, for their own aging. You know, they didn't want to get older. Uh, we think, you know, about even as a society, we don't really embrace aging. Um, you know, I definitely not. Um, yep, and um, all but two employees interviewed say they would never willingly enter a nursing home. Um, and some of them said, you know, my kids better not put me in a nursing home. Uh, so definitely they enjoyed working in a nursing home, but they wouldn't want to live in a nursing home, which really brings up interesting uh, power dynamics between um, individuals that are living in nursing homes and individuals that are working in nursing homes. Okay, so our aging and gender. Uh, so women were expected to be more independent than men. Uh, so it was expected that, you know, women could care for themselves, um, you know, because they probably cared for other people throughout their lives, assuming that they were caregivers. Um, feeling that women um, age better than men do um, and that they're able to handle that aging process, um, you know, a lot better than men. Um, it was stated that women age more gracefully which is it really gracefully or is it, are we aging within the confines of what's expected by society of how we should age? Um, men were expected to be more needy and it seemed that individuals kind of like that. Uh, they like that, you know, men, you know, ask, you know, they ask for more help and I'm willing to, to give it to them. Um, but when some of them were, you know, talking about residents that they, you know, didn't really prefer to work with, um, you know, they spoke of women that were asking for things that they perceived that they could do for themselves. All right, um, so caregiver validation and reward. So this is what I came up with um, after all of the information was kind of put together. Um, so our employees, they identified as a caregiver and they valued that role, but they also preferred residents that were compliant, residents that were grateful, that were thankful um, for the care that they were receiving. And then also they preferred a nursing home resident that was a typical nursing home resident. So, uh, you know, when you think of a nursing home resident, maybe someone is pleasantly confused, uh, you know, uh, maybe they, it, they follow directions, uh, you know, they interact with you. Um, there was a need to be needed. Right? They liked being needed, but they also wanted that individual um, to interact with them in a certain way. Um, so employees also anticipated receiving something of value from the residents in exchange for that care. So a lot of them said, I like working with older adults because they have so much knowledge to share with me. Um, you know, I like working with older adults because they make me feel I can come in and, you know, have a bad day. And, um, you know, my resident makes me feel better about myself. Um, I like my, I like working with these residents because they're so thankful and I feel so good about, you know, providing something for them. And certainly we, you know, go into different areas of work because we enjoy what we do and we receive something um, in exchange, except in this case, we're working with other people and we're expecting them, or at least the individuals in the study, expecting them to, um, you know, give something um, for the care that they're receiving. Um, so again, that brings up questions of, you know, power dynamics um, and, you know, 
certainly the care that's received or, or the care that's given, how that influences that care that's given. Definitely. <laughs> Okay. All right. So combating ageism in healthcare. Um, so I think from, you know, collecting this research and um, seeing what individuals had to say, it gives, you know, a lot, it gives us a lot to think about, certainly. I think reflexivity is important. So making sure that we give ourselves time to pause and, you know, think, why do I have these feelings? Why do I have these thoughts? Um, you know, uh, really question that implicit bias that we have. Um, and patient focused care is really important. So there isn't a one size fits all based on age. Um, you know, we should be caring for people based, um, you know, on their experiences, on their culture, on their individual needs. Um, again, you know, nursing homes and assisted living, they shouldn't be factories. Uh, you know, everyone is a different person. Um, and then celebrating that older age diversity, which might be a little bit harder for us, uh, especially as a society, to certainly do that. But I think we can start doing that with the care that we're providing. Um, so, you know, people are different and then celebrating that difference. Um, and I'm sure we've all, and I don't know, has everyone heard of cultural humility? Hum humility? Yes. You see some nodding. Yes. Okay. So cultural humi humility, adding age to that. So age technically could be a part of cultural humility because people are having certain experiences based on their age. Um, you know, same with gender, same with um, race. So, you know, holding ages systems accountable of something, you know, um, is, oh, Rachel, do you have your hand up? Sorry, I applauded also. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, the, I really like the concept of cultural humility, and I probably won't describe it very well, but you can Google it. Um, kind of just the lifelong learning process, mm -hmm. and you know, you're you're just not going to know everything about every kind of culture and identity, right? So just being open to growth and learning. And um, the the hallway and main building um, before the mail room, you know, the hallway that would lead to faculty parlors is now all of these rooms um, with little libraries and spaces for the students, for all the student clubs, and it's called the Hallway of Cultural Humility. It's where all the bulletin boards are for the clubs. Um, it just got a little revamp last year. It had some offices there last or before, but um, you know, there's posters from protests over the years and resources, tons of books, art supplies, um, and that's the, the new name of it if you haven't been back to campus. And actually, no, they opened it uh, right before COVID. So most of you have not seen it yet. So next time you're on campus, check it out. Um, and any of the students get to use it. It's a really cool space. Um, I'm not sure if they're still using the Women's Resource Center space in the smoke uh, down in the basement of main building, but it's kind of like that kind of space, couches and books, and um, uh, they can borrow books and things like that. Um, and it's a really neat space and it links to some of the college's uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Um, okay. That's awesome. No, that's awesome. That's so cool. Oh, and we had um, a, a doctor who, who teaches about cultural humi hum humility do a workshop at the college for faculty and staff uh, about a month and a half ago, I think. Julie Green, if you look her up, she's really fantastic. Um, and so that was a, a really great workshop for us. That's very cool. Yeah, so I, um, you know, certainly encourage that age is part of that cultural humility. So as we age, we have different experiences. We're not the same person. When we look at our age now, we're not the same person that we were 10 years ago, more than likely. Um, you certainly aren't going to be the same person, you know, 20, <laughs> you know, when you're 40 um, or even, you know, 50 or 60. So those experiences are different. Um, so really that should be a part of, um, you know, a consideration for culture when we're looking at understanding people's cultures. Um, Certainly. So, um, you know, becoming an advocate and um, like Rachel was saying, being a lifelong learner about, um, you know, different cultures and different experiences, we aren't just going to, um, you know, read a book and then magically understand what everyone's been through. You know, it's certainly a process of something that continues. Um, I think we, we definitely need to add some gerontology concepts into education so that students are more aware um, of the aging process. Um, it's not something, you know, that we shouldn't really even talk about. Um, and then hopefully that will provide that shift in perspective that, you know, aging is a natural process. It's something that happens. Um, and in a way, our culture has taught us to fear it. Um, it's something, you know, it's, it's kind of this unknown. And, um, and even, you know, that relates to death and dying, too. I always encourage my students to take classes in death and dying. Um, because, again, it's something that we're all going to experience. And it obviously is unknown. So, um, you know, it might make us nervous. And I think as we age, we realize that we're closer, um, you know, 
to you know that event but there are individuals that you know pass younger it's it's not just old age um, and again um, you know age isn't a, a chronic condition um, you know we're not dying from old age um, you know it's it's generally it's something else it's, a, it's another diagnosis so um, it certainly shouldn't be something to fear um, so that's all I have and I'm five o'clock on the nose that's probably never happened before I usually go over um, and I'm always apologizing but um, I just put my email up there if anyone wanted to reach out and then I'm also on LinkedIn um, I didn't really know how to post <laughs> my uh, if I had a little uh, link for LinkedIn but I'm on there so you can definitely find me if anyone would like to connect certainly it's in, when you look at your profile on LinkedIn, it'll have a, a hyperlink for it for the future. Oh, I, yeah, I completely missed that. I, I'm not very tech savvy. <laughs> same, same. Yeah, that's okay. But you'll know it's me because in the background is a picture of the doc and it's actually Marit and I on the doc. See, this, so you, you've just confirmed one of my theories. What's that? Which is everybody talks about how, you know, younger people, so you're in your forties and Rachel, you're in your thirties. I mean, my, I'm, I'll be 45. Okay. And I'm kind of your two ages combined, sort of. Um, but uh, there's this, you know, this trope, again, trope out there that, you know, young, young people are all tech savvy mm -hmm. and old people are not. And my experience with my students is that I'm a lot more tech. They know a lot more about social media than I do. Mm -hmm. They're more social media savvy, but they're not more tech savvy. I ask them to do certain things with their papers, like put on headers or insert graph, whatever. It's like, help! You know, I mean, they can they can reel off you know fifty seven social media platforms. Mm -hmm. So I think so. I, I I've insisted on making the distinction between social media savvy and tech savvy. You just because two people a lot younger than I am just said they weren't tech savvy. Yeah, you, you, proved, you proved my theory. <laughs> Rhea, just to like reinforce your theory, my 82 year old mother knows how to use her iPhone better than any 20 year old kid. Oh boy, okay. Oh, she's, I mean, she's, my, she's my kind of people. She's your kind of people. <laughs> uh, thanks for thanks for that presentation and your and your research is really interesting. And um, so I'm I'm actually at the University of New Hampshire, and um, there's been a lot of work in in northern New England, you know, and and in Massachusetts on reframing aging. And so I'd love to. To connect with you later and love to continue some of this this work um you know and see what how we can't leverage it and, and learn even more about ageism within facilities and oh yeah definitely yeah. that'd be amazing yeah, great i'm gonna look for you on linkedin right now yes look for me make sure make sure i'm on there and i didn't screw something up okay, well okay let's so, well, let, <laughs> let, let, let me do a search it's me and tara ria Where yes it is it's Marette. Marette's in that picture it's mm -hmm. ara t-a-r-a-h yep Loy. Loy and then Ash. You're about to feel oh, you very came right popular up. You're the first all of a sudden. Came up. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to, uh, we're going to connect. We know, oh, we have seven mutual connections. <gasps> Look at that. Make sure you join the Wells alums community. Including Marette Seymour. Okay. Oh, so I, don't, I don't know if I'm in the Wells alum one. Me check. neither. And Tara, I'm not going to add a personal note. I hope that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. It was really informative and really enjoyed it. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. You're Have welcome. Have a good weekend. And just graduated today. So it's like such a great day. Great oh, my, oh I didn't ceremony. graduate. Oh, was it pictures? My students graduated. Uh, oh, oh yeah. sorry. At the beginning of the call before all, all of y'all got on, we were talking about um, caps and black yes, hair. Yeah, because I had their galley <laughs> on. And then I was, yeah, this is just kind of. I was just got it, got it. <laughs> oh, wait, it was That's graduation day. day. It was, they did this um, like presentation of uh, candidates because they're doing oh. a virtual graduation. So um, right. it was a way for them to cross over a stage and uh, nice. it was also mm -hmm. social, social distance, but they were so excited. It was really, it was really nice. I was happy for them. Right, right. Yeah. So I did oh, that right before. To sleep. Um, Laura just shared some great resources in the chat. And this will be on the Wells YouTube page. If you didn't hear me say it at the beginning um, in a few days, give us give uh, the weekend, but um, all of the other um, talks from this month who, that we were able to report are here also. Mm -hmm. oh, um, nice, so thank you for that them. link, Have that's you. awesome. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank Laura, you. let's connect later. I will, yeah, absolutely, good. good to see yeah. you. Um, yeah. Good to <laughs> thank see you. you. Thanks everybody. Bye. Weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank you're you, right. bye. What are you, what are you up to? Me? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
same old, same old, working hard. All right. <laughs>